This video is brought to you by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you wish to support the channel and allow me to dedicate more time to producing such videos, you can do so with a small monthly donation on patreon.com slash Balkan Odyssey. Balkanization, described as the division of a multinational state into smaller, ethnically homogenous entities, is the embodiment and direct consequence of the Balkan obsession discussed in today's video essay, Separatism. The term Balkanization itself was coined at the end of World War I to describe the ethnic and political fragmentation that followed the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, particularly in the Balkans. The initial frenzy of carving up the remains of the Ottoman corpse unavoidably created an abstruse mosaic of unresolved territorial ambitions, of nations finally liberated after centuries of enslavement. These are dentist ambitions were a direct consequence of the inadequate and insufficient reconciliation of territorial claims following the Act of Liberation, where many nation-states failed to encompass the entirety of their ethnic populations. In this edition of Balkan Obsessions, in our quest of understanding the obsession with separatism, we will first tackle an isolated case that perfectly showcases the troubles that appeared during the process of consolidating national borders in a region of unfinished ethnogenesis and unclear notions of nationality at that point in time. We shall do this by firstly examining the relationship between separatism and irredentism on the example of Albanian statehood in a post-Ottoman world. Then, by using this spatial context and understanding of the causes of reactionary separatism, we will attempt to extract the essence from the fuming separatist movements in the region of ex-Yugoslavia, including Republika Srpska, Herceg Bosna and Sanjak, and how exactly hitherto unsolved national questions inevitably lead to tragic instances of genocide and ethnic cleansing. Although, before we get to the most complex manifestations of Balkan separatism, we first must analyze the inseparable relationship between irredentism and separatism, two concepts which often go hand in hand. There is no better way to observe this relationship but to view the rise of Albanian statehood, which was accompanied by inadequately drawn state borders, whose confines did not properly encompass the entirety of the ethnic Albanian population that was now left estranged in neighboring states. However, this instance of national fragmentation did not weaken the nation's bonds. To the contrary, it has created an atmosphere where the idea of national unification had become paramount even at the cost of infringing the territorial integrity of neighboring countries. This unanimous plea for unification of all ethnic Albanians under one flag has led to the inescapable consequence of separatist movements in neighboring countries whose official, yet in reality only short-term goal, would be the succession from the given country. This act of proclaimed independence would soon unofficially be followed by the assimilation of the breakaway state into the greater ethno-nationalist project. In this case, the self-proclaimed independence of Kosovo is a prime example of this separatist irredentist duality, whose character is unfortunately inherently reactionary. Despite the undeniable reality of the suppression of Kosovo Albanians under the Milosevic regime in Serbia, the separatist movement in Kosovo and wider Albanian irredentist movement have an inherent far-right near-fascist sentiment. This is unfortunately not a case of proletarian nationalism, whose existence ought to be unequivocally supported for the cause of national liberation in the wake of imperialist oppression. While keeping all of the realities of suppression and alienation of the Kosovar population in mind, the independence of Kosovo is ultimately a direct ticket for Albanian ethno-nationalism, an unmistakably reactionary force. Ultimately, the self-determination of the Albanian majority in Kosovo carries the inevitability of continued ethno-nationalist consolidation of more and more territories. The domino effect, triggered by an event such as the merging of Kosovo with the rest of the Albanian nation, has only one tendency, one of the construction of increasingly ethnically pure nation-states in the region, whose mere existence carries the innate threat of the suppression, expulsion and assimilation of leftover minorities, in this case the ethnic Serbs in the northern part of Kosovo, which carries the dangers of ethnic cleansing and further international conflict. 
Throughout the course of this video essay, we will encounter several examples of such tragedy, where seemingly valid, innocent separatist movements uncover the disappointing fascistic character upon their realization. For the time being, let this relationship between seemingly progressive separatism and looming reactionary irredentism on the example of Albanian statehood give us the tools necessary for understanding the upcoming shitshow. Now brace yourselves, because we're moving our microscope over to the Western Balkans. Koreografije, ali i scenario koji su oficijalni spikeri pretposlednjeg sleta mladosti govorili te 1987. godine, zvučalo je kao predskazanje događaja koji će uslediti. Iz združenog jugoslovenskog kola želele su da izađu pojedine republike. Svi su mislili da su u tom kolu oštećeni. Srbije je želela očuvanje zajednice, ali pod uslovom da veze u kolu budu čvršće. Hrvatska i Slovenija su smatrale da one treba da budu kolovođe svojih igara. Crna Gora je igrala u Srbiju, a Makedonija i Bosna i Hercegovina su u početku posmatrale u kom pravcu će glavno kolo da krene. In the previous edition of Balkan Obsessions, I've already talked about the inherent systemic cause of antagonisms between the individual republics, which led to the civil war and dissolution of the Socialist Federation. We went beyond the mere national and ethnic antagonisms that are continuously marketed as the apparent reason for the fragmentation of the country and concluded that the failures of market socialism and the concurrent bureaucratic degeneration of the government structure were the material realities which fueled these shallow separatist notions and led to disaster. Now we shall sum up and expand this analysis with a discussion about the material nature of Yugoslav separatism, its origins and driving forces. The revisionist deviation of socialism which Yugoslavia employed, called market socialism, allowed for, on one hand, the accumulation of foreign debt through IMF debt penetration and, on the other, the private, individual accumulation of capital, and therefore political influence, which created hierarchical anomalies, based on corruption and political influence, within the Communist Party and League of Communists. At the top of these hierarchies were highly successful bureaucrats, whose offices started detaching themselves from the interests of society and the working masses, whereas their ideological principles fitted away as quickly as they came. Their existence was warranted only by the interests of the newly consolidating ruling elite and their capital, foreign and domestic. The Yugoslav government structure descended down an irreversible path of continued liberalization and consequent political fragmentation. This fragmentation of bureaucratic institutions along the borders of the individual republics naturally led to antagonisms between the individual bureaucratic apparatuses, each of whom sought to protect their own capital interests. The most economically developed and industrialized republics, Slovenia and Croatia, were the first ones to seek increased autonomy and ultimately independence, as the grip of the central government in Belgrade was preventing these capital interests from coming to life. On the other hand, the Serbian bureaucracy instigated increased centralization, which went in favor of their ambitious endeavors. 
The unclear and unfinished ethnogenesis of some nationalities, especially the Bosniak Muslims, with their national question still unsolved, guaranteed the inevitability of a brutal civil war as the only way of consolidating borders and building nation-states. Nonetheless, the common denominator among all of these instances of separatism was the following. Capital interests and political adventures of the bureaucratic elites, which sought increased influence and autonomy in pursuit of their own political interests, were sold to the working masses as their collective quote-unquote national interests. Separatist notions on the level of the ruling elite were marketed as the personal interests of each individual working person. In the sentence, Croatia wants independence, it's no longer specified which class is at the forefront of this ambition, and ultimately it didn't matter. All economic and societal shortcomings were blamed on Serbian imperialism, and the working masses of Slovenia, Croatia and Bosnia successfully swallowed the required dose of reactionary impulse, which sufficed in convincing them that only independence from the greater Serbian conglomerate can guarantee them prosperity. Mahali su nam i prisiljavali nas da pristanemo na Z4, na Srpsku Republiku od Zadra i Knina do 28 km od Zagreba sa srpskom vojskom, srpskom valutom, srpskim predsjednikom. To su htjeli da ne bi bilo samostane Hrvatske ili da bi nas prisililo da opet idemo these artificially strengthened antagonisms led to the reawakening of fascist organizations from the Second World War, which haven't been seen for 45 years, armed with guns and money funded by local and foreign domestic interest groups, ready to mortify the most ambitious proletarian pan-Slavic project in history, at the command of the gentlemen in dark suits. Granicu. Svi bi hteli svoju stranicu, tope se snovi kao sante. Ej, komandante, na barikadama su opet zastave, svet ide ko na praznike i decu izvode. Sjutarnje nastave da vide gladne radnike. A gde smo mi naivni što smo se disali na hej Sloveni? Kao da smo uz tu priču izmišljeni. This paradigm is omnipresent in international conflicts and is the cornerstone of the Marxist analysis of history, which goes beyond the cheap, nationalistic marketing stunts of the bourgeoisie, beyond the attempts to repackage their interests as those of the average working person, and their wars as the divine call for every 18-year-old boy who is about to sacrifice his life to fill their pockets. And so it has been since the dawn of mankind.
Having observed the overall historical trends that outlined the separatist movements that led to the dissolution of Yugoslavia, we get a glimpse of the multi-layered nature of these separatist notions. If we could deconstruct Yugoslav separatism into individual components, it would be the following. Number one, capital interests of the respective ruling classes is the material base and origin of separatist ambitions. Number two, quote unquote, national interests, as the commodified form of these capital interests, repackaged and rebranded for the purposes of mobilizing the given population whose capable young men will serve as the final executors of these quote-unquote interests. Although this nationalistic sugarcoating is purely metaphysical, its direct manifestations in the actions of its executors have material significance and reinforce the nationalist rhetoric. Number three, manufacturing consent in the aftermath of the political adventures as a method of artificially justifying the previous conflict and the political structures that arose after it, and legitimizing the rule of the prevailing political party, in the face of obvious social decay. Currently, some 25 years after the war, the third component is as active as ever. It is successfully maintaining the status quo, with the same people, the instigators and warmongers during the 90s, still in power with their asses glued to their armchairs, despite the social decay, mass emigration, poverty, and other daunting problems. This is maintained with a substantial portion of the population involved in schemes of corruption, partocracy, and nepotism that leave many people either scared or blackmailed to seek change, since their personal petty bourgeois interests are also on the line. More concretely, the consent of the subordinate class is manufactured with the following method. Constant reminders about the events of the past and the wrongdoings of neighboring ethnicities, often through commemorations of the victims of massacres and war crimes, are consciously politically instrumentalized. Despite the paroles of forgive but never forget, this often ends up in the form of direct and desperate accusations, which quickly become both sided but more on this in the Balkan obsession with war crimes. Essentially, genuine emotional trauma of desperate people is weaponized for the political campaigns of the self-proclaimed protectors of their nation. Despite the more than obvious corruption and criminal activity, they still prevail as the dominant political forces because they're regarded as the representatives of the quote-unquote national interests of the given ethnicity. Rosa Luxemburg sums up this phenomenon in the following quote. For the capitalist class, militarism has become indispensable. First, as a means of struggle for the defense of quote-unquote national interests in competition against other quote-unquote national groups. Second, as a method of placement for financial and industrial capital. Third, as an instrument of class domination over the laboring population inside the country. End quote. Now, some 25 years after the breakup of the former country, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the media are constantly brewing with stories about the secessionist movement in Republika Srpska, with the not-so-subtle hints about a looming war, with the attempt of renewing fear and trauma within the population as a means of social control. This state of constant fear reinforces the self-proclaimed position and role of the ruling party as the protector of the respective nation from this upcoming conflict. This rhetoric is coincidentally elevated a few months before election day. The warmongering rhetoric is maintained with the help of separatist prospects of Republika Srpska, Herceg Bosna and Sanjak as the unsolved leftover exclaves of the Serbian, Croatian and Bosnian ethno-nationalist projects after the war. With these concrete examples as material manifestations of the sociological phenomena we described in the previous minutes, we come back full circle to the relationship between separatism and irredentism that we described in the first minutes of this video. If we apply that paradigm, derived from the example of Albanian statehood, to the aforementioned separatist movements in Republika Srpska, Herceg Bosna and Sanjak, we have a perfect match. Generally speaking, 
we can observe the same relationship between seemingly progressive separatism with the alleged goal of self-determination and national liberation from the prison of the neighboring country and, on the other hand, the actual, unfortunate reality of ethno-nationalist fusion of territories as an inherently reactionary force. In the particular example of Republika Srpska and Serbian separatism, the political elites have been promoting a separatist narrative for decades in an attempt to destabilize Bosnia and Herzegovina and fortify their position as the saviors of Serbian national interests. Nonetheless, I will talk about this particular topic in an upcoming video. However, in a wider picture, this entire sensationalist rhetoric about the reignition of conflicts in the region, maintained with the help of these separatist irredentist movements, are the essential leverage of the ruling class against a different, progressive outlook on politics. Their existence, their rule, actions and reactions are justified with this fear-mongering. It feeds on the most primitive and fundamental emotional instincts of the working class, resembling vultures and leeches in their shamelessly repulsive and abhorrent methods. Now, as we've observed the methods that the ruling class employs in order to stay in power, justify their existence and maintain mass hypnosis, we can attempt to comprehend their political goals. The principal objective of these political endeavors is the pursuit of profit. Every venture in the domain of politics is based on the protection and increase of capital of the ruling class. This is true for all capitalist societies, no matter their level of development or surface government form. Just like all roads lead to Rome, the economic forces of this stage in human development all lead back to the pursuit of the same goal the acquisition of capital. The methods of pursuing capital interests differ based on a multitude of factors, geographical location, historical context, consequent levels of development, etc. A very specific combination of these elements gave rise to the material conditions present in the Balkan Peninsula. These conditions gave rise to this very idiosyncratic form of political hegemony, unlike any other. The goal of this entire channel is to define these conditions, examine and interpret them. So take a look at the rest of my content if Balkan politics is something that interests you. Nonetheless, the consequences of these political adventures and their class character is self-evident to everyone, regardless of their political orientation. Yet many have trouble connecting the dots and correlating the conclusions of dialectical analysis with the service level symptoms of this rotting system the unprecedented levels of unemployment, absurd levels of debt, continued criminal privatization, poverty, omnipresent corruption, nepotism, partocracy, alarming emigration rates, and the progressively worsening social decay. It is crucial to understand the underlying cause of these issues, the fundamental systemic contradictions within the capitalist system, and the additional burdens of the periphery of global capitalism. Videos and conversation like this one are attempts to take a step into this direction, to try and comprehend at least one small part of this behemoth, approach a vague approximation of the objective truth, and aid us in the pursuit of liberation. However, just like the overarching capitalist form of political organization, these seemingly isolated, microscopic instances of class domination and pursuit of capital are fundamentally unsustainable. Just like capitalism itself, they are riddled with contradictions, whose progressive magnification indicates the inevitable end of the hegemony of capital and class domination. Marxism and the movement of scientific socialism are sets of tools of the working class to pinpoint, interpret, and ultimately demolish this hegemony. It's a tool whose significance and relevance is not only still alive and well, but progressively more and more relevant, despite the exponential increase in opportunistic and revisionist diversions. So, what is to be done concretely? For one final time, I leave this part to Michael Parenti. I remember during the Iraq War, uh, a student said to me, well, that's where you and I differ, you see, because I have faith in the president. He was talking about George Bush. He said, I, I said, excuse me, you have faith? in the president? So I trust the president. I have faith in him. 
So what, I said, what does that mean? You have faith in the president. This isn't religion. I mean, you have faith in him the way my Italian grandma had faith in St. Anthony. Do you have a picture of George Bush on your bureau? You light little candles to him, do you? <laughs> Democracy isn't about faith. It isn't about trust. It's about distrust. It's about accountability. It's about challenge. It's about debate. It's about exposure. It's about people becoming the active agents of their own lives, wanting to know what's going on. I don't have to trust you. I don't want to trust you. I want to see what's going on. Whose interests do you really represent, my friends? And yes, we, we, the real we, we, we really do have to do something. Call the White House, call your Congress people, your media, talk back, demonstrate, organize, agitate, educate yourself and others. Let them know how you feel. Don't think they're not interested, my friends. Oh, man, are they interested in it. Oh, man, do you think they are not watching you all the time? Why do you think guys like me are under surveillance? They want to know what the general public is thinking. They never stop thinking about you. When you say, oh, they don't care what we're thinking. Oh, no, they always, always focus on you because they know they're standing on your shoulders. And if this great mass began to shrug and rumble and all that sort of thing, it gets very wobbly up there. So against the lies... against the lies and the homicidal violence of this national security aberration, the thin, frail voice of reason and democracy can become a mighty chorus and a strong resistance. I have seen it happen before, and we can make it happen again. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.